Now, I'm going to hand over to Philippe Johnson. Now, Philippe is the uh, Director General of Digital Services and the National President of the CIO Association of Canada. Sorry, Director General of, of uh, Digital Services of Transport Canada and the National President of CIO Association of Canada. So, Philippe, over to you to say a few words. Where'd Philippe go? There he is. Unmute yourself, Philippe. We'll make you the rock star that you deserve to be. I have a, I actually have a t-shirt uh, that we've developed for the association that says exactly that you're on mute. Um, so, so I, 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 at some point in time, hopefully uh, we'll be able to start selling those on our website and you guys can all get a, a t-shirt because I think it's extremely relevant. Um, I want to thank everybody here for inviting me. Uh, by, by no means uh, do I consider myself uh, an expert or a guru or the person that knows everything. Uh, however, what I do know is that I like to, I, like I'm totally engaged with how technology can solve problems for our businesses, for our organizations. Uh, I'm also totally aware about how the role of uh, our, our senior IMIT business leaders in our organizations uh, and, and, and Eve, who works for me, is on the call as well. Uh, he, can, he can tell you how critical our role is, has been in terms of ensuring that Canada continues to, to, to function in these COVID-19 times and, uh, and how critical we've been over the past eight months to make that happen. Uh, at, at a high level, um, you know, I think I, in the... the the session that I was at a little bit, and Denis was kind of mentioning it. Uh, the, the role I think moving forward with uh, with digital leaders, CIOs, chief digital officers, uh, chief te technology officers, CISOs, whatever you want to call yourself, our, our goal is to uh, leverage transformation but not just do it within our own selves, do it with our own framework. Uh, it's very important, especially now, to kind of expand that reach for digital transformation as a culture change across your organization, across your business lines, across your, your, uh, your programs or your policy units, your headquarters, wherever it can be. And, and from my perspective, over the past year and a half at Transport Canada, working with, uh, with Eve and with Julie and, and the various people in my organization, we've done a lot of work on expanding our role in terms of uh, making sure digital is embraced, making sure digital is understood, making sure that they can be combined to deliver exceptional quality services for our organization and enabling people to, uh, to really have like in individual entrepreneurship or innovation to look at ideas for solving problems. Uh, so so I, I wanna say that, you know, kind of our catchphrase that I wanna share with everybody here that we've leveraged at Transport Canada that has really enabled this to happen. And we've, we've delivered this catchphrase to every single employee in our organization. And, and uh, there's just three, 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 three items I want to say, and I think they can apply to everybody here. And I, I hope you can leverage them because they really do make a difference. Uh, first of all, we want to be agile. We want to be able to pivot. We want to be able to make changes. We want to be able to adjust. Uh, this past year with COVID, Transport Canada has issued over 21 new regulations or policies to ensure uh, safe transport of Canadians. Uh, it, whether it's in airplanes, whether it's in rail or it's marine. And so we've been able to pivot on that. So agile from a business perspective there, we want to be smart and it's not about being book smart. It's not having a PhD. It's just about having common sense and being able to look at problems and leverage those opportunities uh, to, to be, uh, to, to look at the opportunities and leverage them in the moment uh, while still uh, retaining, you know, at least from our perspective, our regulatory and, and legislative mandate. And I, I wanna give you a, a, an example on that one that was really, really powerful for me. Uh, we deployed MS Teams and Eve did that. He's on the call right now back in September of last year. 
we predicted uh, COVID, I guess. No, we didn't, but we predicted uh, that MS Teams would become our most invaluable tool to keep business running. Uh, and we'd started that even before uh, COVID. And so when March hit, uh, we, we just had to add a few thousand accounts. We have about 6,000 employees and we were able to quickly pivot and get the organization working. But what was really cool that happened two or three months after we went and kind of distributed MS Teams everywhere is that our inspectors who had to be COVID safe and, and do seamless inspections without being close to people started to leverage MS Teams for their virtual inspections. And so that was really, really powerful. And that's the smart piece. You know, people being able to be on their toes and leverage technologies to meet the mandate or the objective of today. And finally, I think this applies to every industry. You need to be trusted. If you're not trusted, you are going nowhere. Your customers, your clients won't, won't value you. And finally, uh, you know, at least from a Canadian public sector perspective, if the Canadian government's not trusted, uh, you, you really can't move things forward and you can't get people behind you. So in terms of opening remarks from a digital transformation perspective, I thought I would share those three kind of impactful uh, strategic things that a culture needs to, 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 to kind of embrace and, uh, and really get behind. And I think once you do that, you can really uh, create digital transformation across your organization. Not sure if, uh, if that's all the time I had, uh, but, yeah, no, that's uh, great. I'd like to bring um, Tony, uh, Tony Olivet on now, who's going to be the moderator for the, the panel. So let's, uh, let's add him in and I'll bring the rest of the panel in as Tony introduces them. Great. Thanks, Warwick. And uh, thanks, Philippe, for those uh, introductory comments. I'd love uh, one of those T-shirts. Uh, you're on mute. That's great. <laughs> love that. Um, yeah, it's my pleasure to uh, moderate the panel today. And uh, just a, a note out to to Phil Mackay about uh, the whole Engage ETX uh, experience over the years has been great. Glad we're able to do it this year online, but it would have been better in person. So uh, we'll do with uh, what we can here. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce back again to, to the panel, Denny Gaudreau from Intel, who you heard earlier, uh, my colleague, Elizabeth Calder from IDC, Dave, David Savitson, who is the Applied Data Principal and consultant at MNP. Half of you, uh, about half of you heard him in the uh, breakout case study. It was a fascinating one. And I think David, there is an outstanding question you were about to answer. We'll get to that in a few minutes. <laughs> and then um, a new participant to the session today is Alexis Pappas. Alexis is the executive director of the Canadian Blockchain Association for Women and the director and co-founder of the 1D Network. So Alexis, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and what the association's about and what 1D Network does? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Tony. It is such a pleasure to be joining this amazing community. It's been such a great event so far with uh, just uh, amazing speakers. And um, we are really proud to be a new association partner of Engage and ETX at the Canadian Blockchain Association for Women. Our mandate is to build a national ecosystem that supports women exploring careers in blockchain and helps them participate in the new digital economy. Uh, we have a great board composed of members from all kinds of diverse industries. And uh, we're looking forward to being a part of some of the content of upcoming events as well. Uh, for 1D Network, uh, we provide secure identity and access management solutions that use blockchain technologies to create an ecosystem of transferable credentials. So very excited to be participating today and looking forward to the panel. Great, thanks, Alexis. That's, um, it sounds like a very interesting opportunity for growth and learning. Um, and maybe I'll start with uh, a question for you uh, around um, the CIO's role. And you know, across all industries, we're seeing CIOs leading a wave of change in digital transformation but they're facing many structural challenges to bring about that change. Can you talk about how an inclusive culture can help CIOs bring more innovative and collaborative organizational behavior, if you will? Absolutely, thank you so much. So obviously this is an incredibly challenging time to be a CIO. Uh, over the last months, the kind of wave of digital transformation that we've been experiencing has 
as uh, Elizabeth said earlier, become a complete tsunami. This is just such a disruptive moment in time. Uh, according to a study earlier this year by McKinsey and Company, in the first eight weeks of the pandemic, digital adoption across businesses and consumers leapt forward about five years. So a big congratulations to all of the CIOs who helped make that massive pivot happen. It's just incredible to think about. So for CIOs and agile organizations, being able to realize major technological shifts like that relies on driving new levels of innovation and collaboration and inclusive policies can help support both. There is an amazing number of studies, including one that came out last year from the Harvard Business Review, that demonstrate that diverse organizations, especially with gender diversity and leadership, help build a really strong culture that supports creative problem solving, higher productivity, and really committed, unified, and empowered teams that can align around a common vision. And this translates into real business value. Uh, according to the Boston Consulting Group, uh, management teams that are diverse, especially with female representation, have an average of about 19% higher revenues due to innovation. And this is something that I've seen in my area of technology and blockchain, which is extremely collaborative and requires a lot of, uh, a lot of collaboration among really diverse counterparties and partners, that women are leading these ecosystems, especially in Canada. Uh, so the head of our national blockchain consortium uh, is a woman, and she's driving a lot of innovation in industry and bringing a lot of teams together. I myself at the Canadian Blockchain Association for Women. So Definitely, you know, diversity is more than just the right thing to do and building these inclusive policies. It can help lead to the kind of transformations that, you know, we really desperately need right now in these uncertain times. Oh, that's great. It's, it's super relevant. And even at IDC globally, we have just kicked off a, an international diversity and inclusion uh, council and program. I'm part of it uh, in the Canadian group, but it is an international uh, initiative. And I, I think it's uh, extremely important and relevant. Um, just kind of on that uh, topic and the whole notion of the future of work, I, I want to bring Denny back into the discussion. And, you know, when we talk about the future of work and the future workplace, do you have any thoughts on what that's going to look like um, going forward post pandemic, Denny? <laughs> yeah. So it's, uh, I, I guess pretty much every organization I think is taking the, uh, the COVID-19 opportunity to pivot, right? So, and figure out, so what is going to be? So I can, I can tell you like from an Intel point of view, we're really shifting. So years ago, right around 2005, we made that move to have a mobile workforce. So kind of reading of the, all the PCs and just focusing on laptop and wireless and everything. So now, so like uh, really next, I would say next spring. So we're looking like 2021 to really to shift to, that uh, having, I would say, three, uh, three working model, right? We'll always have a job that will, you'll need to be on site, but we'll open up to that hybrid role so where you can be working at the office a couple of days and working remotely. And also, uh, main role will be fully virtual. So because, uh, and, and that's going to open up, like I said, I think during my keynote, that we will open up to a lot of uh, new talent that were not uh, available, I would say, for us from, uh, uh, from, from an organization point of view, right? So that's that's how we're looking at the workplace transformation, I would say, uh, itself. And if we move to the future of work, so like Alexi was mentioning, for sure, like the, 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 the diverse point of view is super important because uh, we're looking at more and more complex and they need more and more innovation and we need any kind of background uh, in to, to fix those problems and innovate faster. And also looking at the, how technology will be leveraged, right? So in the past was leveraged, the mechanical, I would say improvement was leveraged to help people physically. So now that future of work will be augmented by technology, right? To with, with AI to help you to be a better work, or just to have more uh, I would say feedback on, on when it's time to make decision, to improve your judgment, your intuition, so help you imagination, so all those creativity and everything, right? So that, that, that's what we're looking, uh, I would say, moving forward, but definitely the, uh, the role of the workplace will be a different than it used to be uh, before, so. Right, right. I'd, I'd love to get uh, David's perspective um, on a related point, which is this, you know, in, we're talking about digital transformation, the agile CEO 
How do you actually foster a climate of innovation in an organization while at the same time managing costs and risks? That's a, a reality that everyone has to face, especially in high risk areas like the application of AI or machine learning. I know yeah. you gave a, it was a fascinating case study. So can you just give your perspective on that, David? Uh, sure. I, I'm going to go back to something that uh, Philippe mentioned uh, in terms of um, you know being agile, but also having uh, common sense, quite frankly. And sometimes um, I don't know if you've heard this um, uh, this this expression. Sometimes you need to sort of move slower so you can move faster. And uh, we're big advocates of not. E- you know, some people equate agility to, you know, they say, oh, we need to be agile and the needle goes all the way over to the, um, okay, you know, here's an application, let's hire a data scientist, let's start building a POC, a proof of concept. And before you know it, you're in, you know, you're in deep with hundreds of thousands of dollars with uh, no clear understanding as to, you know, whether that use case actually makes any sense, whether the output could actually ever be applied. Um, And when we started doing a lot of research on the subject um, about a year or so ago, uh, in terms of um, what does best practice look like in this space, um, we found that there was just an incredible amount of what we call science fair projects in the space of AI and ML, which is projects being selected and rushed and you hire the data scientist and you get going and you develop the POC um, and then it dies because the project that was selected in a very agile way had absolutely zero chance of ever being uh, deployed at scale or being applied because a thoughtful a methodical approach using a, a well thought out framework in terms of identifying candidate projects, rapidly moving them through the various gates in terms of de-risking them, taking the identified uh, candidate projects and doing proper opportunity assessments on them before you start spending heavily um, on AI and ML um, is a critical lever uh, in being able to do um, exactly what Philippe was saying, move fast, uh, but do it in a common sense uh, a way. Um, and trust me, you know, we're not advocates of slowing down anything, uh, but just make sure that you have uh, properly vetted uh, and gated uh, the opportunities before you uh, start um, uh, applying uh, AI and ML to them. And of course, the other lesson, of course, is that uh, organizations believing that, okay, I'm going to be agile, I'm going to go hire a data scientist, and that's all I need uh, to get AI and ML uh, deployed. Uh, with the democratization of coding and technology, the actual a- a data scientist itself is probably one of the least important things in the whole team of applying um, AI and ML to, uh, 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 to problems. And that's, I would say, is be thoughtful, uh, balance urgency with common sense, um, yeah. and uh, that's the way to go. Now, that makes a lot of sense. I do see, uh, Philippe, you're nodding your head a lot. Anything to add to that, uh, the comments from David or... Uh... Give a couple of, or one example or two where where that was really applied. Yeah, I I I really uh, I have to echo a lot of what David has said, and and my fear has always been you start something new and shiny, and then all of a sudden uh, it just fizzles out in six months or four months. So I, I this is where I think even though you're the agile CIO, you need to to think about how you're going to make this sustainable how are you going to create the, uh, the 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 criteria whether and i'm just going to go through a, a little bit of a laundry list financial how are you going to manage this moving forward so even when you're trying to be agile what are some of the ways that you're going to fund this uh i'll give you a quick example for us for rpa we've got an rpa center of excellence so right away even those words center of excellence they help us create that nucleus of knowledge or understanding about how we're going to do our PA, meaning how are we going to engage with the unions if jobs are involved? How are we going to create the procurement strategy to bring in various components of our PA? Like one RPA might not solve all of our problems. How are we going to create an ability to train uh, bot owners across the business? Like So this is where those higher level thoughts that I think David was probably looking at and thinking about that as a CIO or a, you're the leader in your organization from driving digital uh, transformation, you need to bring those to the equation. If you don't think about those things, 
what David just said is going to happen. It's going to be like a fad and you're going to think you've, you've solved the problem. Uh, definitely with RPA though, what's lovely just in that particular example, you know, we've got a, a project that is going to save about 20, uh, 20 people's time or effort annually. So here's where we can start thinking about a self-sustaining model for RPA. I, you know, I've told the business, I only need two, two people in my shop to manage the infrastructure, the technology, the, uh, uh, the actual RPA platforms themselves. They need two bot owners. So we've trained them to learn bot, bot algorithms in the business. And I think that speaks a little bit to being the agile CIO. Those skill sets are now moving back out into the business. Uh, back in the early 2000s, when IT was really uh, just starting, the business components siloed up a whole bunch of their own IT infrastructures, their own programs. And essentially, you probably had like 13 systems that all did the same thing. And then in the mid 2000s, 2010, the role of the CIO came about and we brought those in in an enterprise fashion. We probably saved our organization's time and money. But now in the fourth industrial revolution, this is now going back out to the business. And these technologies, we need to embrace those and figure out just exactly in, the, in kind of how I described the role of the CIO in our group in terms of developing that RPA COE. That also has to be done in conjunction with the business to get the maximum value to still be agile, but yet still be able to keep this uh, momentum moving forward for years until another technology comes into play that replaces RPA for whatever reason, and then we'll pivot again at that time. So uh, I hope that was helpful. I, I just, when, when David was speaking, it just sounded so right. Uh, I thought I would nod my head a lot, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Uh, I do wanna uh, switch gears a little bit and. We were committed to answering some questions from the group. And David, you were in the middle of answering one during your case study when we switched back to the main session here. So I think it was related to your timelines on your um, ML project, correct? Uh, yes, I'll answer it very quickly. Um, the MVP, uh, roughly uh, six months. Uh, and then again, I don't want to lead anybody astray here. These things are complicated. They're tough. Um, it definitely helps. I think somebody else, I think it was Denis mentioned this platform, having a great platform is a fantastic accelerator and enabler uh, in the cloud. Um, but anytime you are working on third platform concepts where you're combining social, mobile, analytics, and cloud, it takes time. Uh, and this from soup to nuts, I think was roughly um, a two-year two effort. Great. Great. Thanks. Um, Elizabeth, I'm going to send a question over to you. This came in through the group. Um, to be successful with digital transformation, business needs to manage the paper to digital change process well, or adoption can fail. Is guidance available to support organizations through the change process? Um, so the, there's a lot of guidance out there that um, on, a, on a level applies in terms of through the change process. But if I speak specifically to the paper to digital, um, you know, I think there are, there are a lot of companies who've started in on the, the straightforward things like digital signatures and, and those kinds of things. But I think we certainly saw through COVID that there are a lot of sectors that um, were more challenged because they still are aggressively paper oriented and that's really where they um, have needed to stay. Uh, you know, so, but I, I would support, you know, going back to Philippe's comment about you as the CIO need to think think about how these things happen. You can't, you can't sit back and hope the business has a change agent. You can't sit back and hope that that change management team is going to, is going to organize all of this because how, you know, the, your first step is how you're going to continue. Um, so I would focus on uh, to start with three, three kind of big bubbles. The first one is uh, don't underestimate the, the culture. Um, I've seen things that were uh, absolutely a viable, sustainable, amazing project in this space, and everybody gets all excited, and 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 the business is on board, and the technology is is there through a proof of concept, and then all of a sudden you hit the wall when the enterprise risk dudes get in the room, 
because they want to put some ridiculously high thresholds on what's allowed. And so as a result, you know, none of it's, none of it's going to be real anyway. So make sure that from a culture perspective, whatever it is you're tackling, um, you've, you've got the people on board and, and, and like fail early. If, if the threshold on something being able to be digital instead of on paper with a signature is going to be $50,000 and you're trying to do something that will enable $100,000 transactions, might as well know that day one and just, you know, start back over and find something else. Uh, to David's yeah. point, like picking a, a, a project that makes common sense is good. So think think through the players and the culture and make sure that that's there. Um, the second thing that I think we as the CIO need to think through very carefully in advance of, of embarking or to be successful in this space is around context. Um, you can't a lot of times we, we see a business, we work with the business, we get a business case that assumes something's going to very quickly go to, well, 100% we're going to go to digital from paper. Um, but if you, only, if you only look or the business only looks at 80% of the process and they leave 20% of the process paper oriented, then you're not going to make that business case. Um, so to, to Phil's notes on being trusted in, in you know, maybe I've just been a CIO for too long, but the CIO is always the one standing there looking like an idiot when something can't get all the way through because only 80% of the process was, was touched. So again, you know, lean in, take responsibility for um, pushing the people to make sure that the context matches what you're trying to do or you're going uh, you're, you're gonna to be the one standing there trying to explain why it didn't quite work as planned. Um, and then the final thing to me is, is the element of um, commitment. And as, as the technology leader, as the digital initiative driver, um, you know, Phil's, Phil's common sense, David's pick a spot. You've, you've really got to make sure that you pick something that you can do well and follow through, especially if after everything we've been through in the last eight or nine months, you still got people in your organization, you know, if, if you're not, if, if that hasn't put to bed every paper to digital debate in your organization over the last nine months, you, you really, really need to figure out, you know, how, how you're going to navigate through these things. Um, if, if you've got, if you've got low hanging fruit that you haven't been able to push over the line, if you've got objections, whether overt or passive aggressive, whatever they are, if, if you're if you're still having a hard time with these business cases and with these strategies, um, you you really need to drive to that common sense thing and and find those things that are going to be sustainable and successful. Yeah, that's I, great, I, I, Barry. I hope that answered your question. That that's great advice, Elizabeth. And yes, uh, I know you. everyone. I know everyone wants to continue the discussion, but I'm also mindful of time work. As you mentioned, uh, the 90 minutes is going to go fast. And here we are. We have one minute left in the program. Thank you to the panelists. Um, great advice. And uh, back to you, Warwick. Thank you so much. Yes, a huge thank you to all of our panelists. We really appreciate you, you being there. Uh, well, that's it. We, we wanted to stick to the 90 minutes to do our uh, formal closing. I'd like to welcome back to the stage the man himself. He's the driving force behind it all. Please welcome uh, Phil Mackay. Good to have you back here. And just unmute yourself. We'll get you a T-shirt. I, 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 want, I want a T-shirt. <laughs> um, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this as much as uh, we all did. Uh, what great, great content. I am thrilled um, as this is our first in a series and I cannot wait till our next one, which is uh, January 28th, but we'll get, we'll get to that um, and we'll send you information on it. I, I really wanna thank our partners, IDC Canada, especially Lars, uh, Tony, Joe, his team, Elizabeth. Um, there's a great group of people up there. If you don't work with them, you really should give them a call. They're wonderful and, and they're very bright and they can help your business. I wanna thank Philippe, his organization, 
Um, and Philippe works tirelessly on his own job. His second job is a CIO association. Uh, he has a lot of great people that work with him. That's another great group to work with. And again, welcome Alexis and the women in blockchain. And we, I look forward to working very closely with you in, in the future. But the, it, I can't do anything without our sponsors, Intel and m and and David and, and Denny. Uh, Denny's been with us many times. It's always a pleasure. And David, welcome to our family. And But these events are all about the CIOs and technology leaders of Canada. You've stayed the whole time. I hope you got something out of this. If you have any questions, for any of our presenters, please let us know. We'll, we'll send it on to them. And if you want to meet with them one-on-one -on -one, uh, with their teams, we can also make that happen. But I want to thank you all. We can't wait for the next time, but be safe. And I know it's a little early. Have a wonderful holiday season, too, if we don't talk to you. Thank you all. Thanks, Bill. Thank Thanks, you so Phil. much. That's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. And remember, think positive in these weird and wonderful times. Think positive, but test negative. All right, we'll look forward to your company next time. Thank you so much for being here. You've been fantastic. I've been Warwick. Catch you later. <laughs>